Kate, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here for this discussion, I think particularly because it brings together two of my uh, favourite institutions in Victoria, the University of Melbourne and the State Library here in Victoria for this uh, terrific partnership. Now, as Kate said, uh, among... Uh, I guess the many things that changed utterly uh, with the uprising in Dublin in 1916 were events in Australia, and particularly here in Melbourne during those long, dark days of the war, and of course long after. So for the next hour or so, we're going to look at the stories behind some of the exhibits here at the library, and I hope if you haven't seen them, you certainly will do so. And, and of course, what a story they tell us of the power and the pull of, of Irish history. Uh, look, Kate has already uh, introduced our panel, Fergal McGarry, uh, Kevin Malloy, uh, Gillian Russell, but I'm going to make special mention here <laughs> of the gorgeous John Clark. Now, John is here for a very special reason. Um, I think it's fair to say, John, you are working through a lifelong identity crisis, having grown up thinking that you are part of an orange clan from the north, you discover these very, very green connections and there's an interesting family connection. I'm going to get you to hold that right at the moment. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But I do want to start. I want to start because, uh, as I say, this is we're making this link between Dublin and Melbourne. So, Kevin Malloy, I want to start with you. One of the, the most arresting um, exhibits here is a photograph of Daniel Mannix outside Raheen. And there are these beautiful white horses. And the notes tell us there are 14 VC winners astride these horses. It's St. Patrick's Day. There we have it there. It's St. Patrick's Day, 1920. Tell us about the context of this photograph. What, what has happened uh, ahead of this? And I, and I gather this brings out, is it 100,000 onto the streets of Melbourne for this parade? Why such a big deal? What's gone on? Thanks, Maxine. Symbolically, in many ways, this is really the high point of uh, Irish Australia. Um, this is where there was a clear understanding of the place of the Irish Catholic community in the country and an acknowledgement of the, that allegiance could still be maintained to the idea of an independent Ireland, um, to one's religious beliefs, um, and one could also be a loyal Australian. Uh, Brenda Nile is right when she says that the St. Patrick's Day parade of 1920 was more than just a day out for the Irish. Um, for many Melburnians, the turnout of 100,000 was reminiscent of a royal parade. Um, but this time, it was the Irish Catholic population publicly confirming its place in Victorian society as a distinct group with its own leaders, and certainly with Daniel Mannix. More importantly, it silenced Mannix's many critics on the point of his disloyalty. The Doyle was outlawed, as was Sinn Féin, the Irish War of Independence was still in train, and yet to turn into the vicious campaign that it did later in the 1920s. It was pure theatre. It was organised by Mannix's friend, John Wren, who paid for the White Horses and organised 14 Victoria Cross winners and 6,000 ex-servicemen who walked behind Mannix's car. In addition, he organised the filming of the whole proceedings. So why, why was it important? Um, certainly Mannix, Mannix did, did change his mind once the, the leaders of the 1916, execu uh, 1916 Rising were executed. Morgan Jagers, in a letter to, to Henry Bourne Higgins, said that the post-execution post of, of the leaders of 1916 took fire in the young men's brains in, in Melbourne. Um, and in some ways, the, the whole emotional, um, emotional commitment from, from Mannix, the change from a slight ambivalence to uh, outrage, uh, took place in the, in the, after the execution. Uh, Mannix then went on um, through the next few years um, to seriously challenge conscription as well as maintaining the idea of, of an Irish, um, Irish rights for independence. So who were these men? Six of them were Catholic. One of them, John Carroll, known as the Wild Irishman by his comrades. Um, he had missed the VC three times before it was finally invested. Four of the winners later divorced and two ended up destitute. However, two, William Curry and John Dwyer, became parliamentarians. Um, 
Can I just ask you one, one quick, before I bring Fergal into this, uh, Kevin, um, uh, to what extent was Mannix um, not, a, not a lone cleric, but he was out there in terms of the rest of the Australian Catholic clergy, was he not on this question? He was. Uh, there, weren't, there weren't many people who, who supported his view or who really understood uh, the change in his position. And I think one of, one of the things that, have, that has come out um, after the conference over the last two days is that you know, Mannix moved from a very secluded environment um, uh, at Maynooth uh, to becoming um, working in a parish in Melbourne. And I think it was the, being exposed to, uh, to people on a day-to-day -day level and uh, to the economics of survival um, changed his political position um, in Melbourne. Fergal, can I bring you in at this point? By the way, you're seeing um, slides here on a loop and not necessarily in the order that we're discussing at the moment. I'm just wondering, can we go to the generic slide just for the next 10 minutes or so? Is that possible? Yeah, the, the slide right at the beginning. Thanks so much. Okay. Fergal, can I bring you in? I want to start, this, there's so much to talk about here, but just to pick up on this business of Catholicism and republicanism. Now, to go to the events of 1916 in Dublin, uh, not all of the rebels... Uh, were Catholic, but most were, weren't they? Yeah, it's, it's quite a complex uh, issue. I mean, the, the, the rebels were revolutionaries. They were, they were far in advance of kind of general public opinion. And during Easter week itself, it's clear that, that uh, an awful lot of Dubliners are opposed to what they're doing. You know, they're bringing death and destruction to the streets. Um, so so there's that, 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 that's an important kind of uh, context. And it's really only at the end of Easter week that you begin to get a, a sense of a kind of a shift in public opinion. And it's for a lot of different reasons. Why the rebels have held out for a week, and, um, or, or almost a week. Um, but it's also how they, um, how they behave at the end. You know, they, uh, they, they, they surrender en masse. They don't try and escape. They come out of the, the various garrisons and surrender their arms. And then you get to the stage of um, repression. Um, speeches from the dock. Um, the executions begin. Not a huge number of rebels are killed. I mean, 16 are executed, which isn't a big number, but the way in which this plays out um, has a big emotional impact. Two or three men are shot at dawn every two or three days. Public anger begins to build. Um, there's a sense that these people, although they fought like, like troops on the Western Front, they're being shot like criminals. Um, the country is under repression. Thousands of people, more in fact than took part in the rising, are being arrested. So you begin to kind of shift in opinion. But the Catholic and that was beyond Dublin as well, wasn't it? There were yes, arrests absolutely. across the country. Yeah, so people are rounded up in places which, which didn't rise. But it's really in that process of repression and execution that you begin to see the Catholic dimension becoming uh, very uh, powerful. I mean, so, some of the rebels had been Republicans, secular Republicans, socialists. Some of them, of course, were Catholics, particularly the rank and file. But the executions um, and the sense that martyrs are being created feeds into a, into a kind of a Catholic um, propaganda. Because all the Republican newspapers have been suppressed in the aftermath of the rising, one of the few uh, um, um, organs to give any kind of publicity to the rebels is the Catholic Bulletin. And it, it talks about the rebels, even people like James Connolly, who were, who were Marxists, it talks about them as kind of dying for faith and fatherland. And in fact, you, you see some of the Protestant leaders of the rising convert to Catholicism. Um, and of course, the, the key kind of figurehead um, of the Easter Rising becomes Patrick Pierce. And Pierce had written a lot of poetry before the Rising, comparing himself to Christ. And the Rising takes place at Easter. And Pierce believed that it was true, true personal uh, a blood sacrifice that you could create a kind of, um, you could redeem the nation. So that kind of dialogue in fact, what kicks do, in. What do you make of that? I mean, well, in terms of a modern sensibility, um, uh, this, what, what is, Pier is Pierce's self-consciously wanting to create what a, a Catholic martyrdom? Yeah, I mean, I think the rising is, 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 is should be considered really as pro propaganda of the deed rather than a kind of a military conflict. There's no sense that they can seize power, defeat the British. What they're doing is they're, they're, they've orchestrated this kind of gesture. It's often compared to kind of street theater. And the person who's really written the script and who most clearly perceives how the power of the rising will be as a kind of a myth, a kind of a story, a creation myth, is Patrick Pierce. And Pierce is consciously emulating figures like Robert Emmett. If you look at the proclamation, it talks about um, 18, 1798, 1803, 1867. So they're kind of writing themselves into history. And of course, the, the, British, the response of the British authorities falls perfectly into this because had they just been arrested and shipped off to Tasmania, as happened in 1848, 
the, you know, there wouldn't have been a kind of a, a, a transformation of public opinion and an outpouring of um, anger uh, and, and the subsequent changes. So Pierce is, in a sense, is the, the figure amongst the rebels who, who most clearly sees that, that what they're doing is a kind of staging propaganda. But it's also a little bit misleading because the, the people who really organized the rebellion were the Fenians, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, people like Tom Clark and Sean McDermott, and they had a different sort of set of motives. They're not interested in blood sacrifice. They're kind of hard-headed revolutionaries, and they just want to transform politics. Um, so, does, so Pierce, in a sense, crowds out the other motives that were at work, some of which were much more kind of um, secular and radical and socialist. Let's talk about the proclamation. Of course, it's a, a, a copy of one of the, the 1917 reproductions that's here in the library. Gillian, tell us about this proclamation, the look of it, how it's worded. Mm, yeah. What do we take from that? And, and it, it was it, again, was it, was it very much conceived as a foundational document? Yes, um, just to pick up on, on what Fergus just said there, if you think about this as like, as theatre. Just um, hold that oh, a bit closer. Okay, if you think about it as, as theatre, then this is, the, this is the advertisement, this is the playbill um, saying, uh, combining, uh, announcing um, what was going to happen, but also it, it combines uh, that announcement with a kind of manifesto and a declaration of independence. So, um, and it's going back, it's, it's uh, going back to uh, the Emmett um, rising of 1803 when Emmett kind of uh, produced a, a similar um, outline of the provisional... Uh, just oh, sorry. Yes, Give us yeah, the history Ro of 1803 in a couple Robert, of lines. Robert Emmett uh, and uh, a, a, a small group band tried to kind of um, revive the revolutionary impulse of 1798 by seizing some kind of buildings, um, trying to seize some buildings in um, Dublin, but they were thwarted um, and uh, the rebellion failed. Um, uh, but Emmett's tried, and in his trial, he uh, gives a very powerful speech about how he doesn't want his epitaph written until Ireland has achieved nationhood. So, and Emmett is a, like, a very profound influence on Pierce, and in a sense, like as, as Fergal says, that um, the, the proclamation, and, and in a sense, the rising as a whole is uh, an attempt by Pierce to kind of fulfill what Emmett wasn't able to achieve. But uh, the other dimension of it as a proclamation is that proclamations were ways in which um, the government the, uh, the, uh, was able to communicate information um, to the population. Um, a few days after the rising starts, there's actually a proclamation of martial law. So in a way, what, uh, by uh, um, imitating the form of the proclamation, the, the rebels were, were trying to kind of assert their sovereign authority. Like they're the equivalent of, of the monarchy. So the actual form of the proclamation itself is an expression of what they want to achieve in terms of usurping uh, authority and declaring themselves a sovereign, a sovereign nation. And I think that partly explains the kind of iconic impact, the enduring power of that document, because it's so multivalent as well. Yeah. And, and just to list, continue the story there, Pierce reads this proclamation out yep. outside the GPO. Yes. Tell us about that event. There, there, there's hardly a, a thunderous crowd to, there to receive yes, this, is yes. that right? Um, at, at our conference, we, we heard a great um, keynote lecture from Roisin Higgins here, he's in the, in the fr uh, front row. Um, and uh, it, it is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very interesting because the, the proclamation is printed on the run and under extreme pressure. They finish it at, at around between 12 and 1 o'clock in, uh, in the morning of, of, uh, of the Monday. Um, and then it's kind of... Uh, on Easter Monday morning, on it's Easter, finished. Yeah, yeah. It's, right, right uh, to yeah. deadline. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we know a lot about how it was actually produced because of the Bureau of uh, Military History um, records of, of what the printers did, how they kind of fabricated it. So, and then um, uh, Pierce reads it... Uh, reads it out at 12 o'clock, but there's a sense in which like, the, the people around really don't know what's going on here. Um, so in contrast, uh, like 
so the proclamation figured really significantly in the recent you know, East, uh, commemorations over Easter week. So if you go to YouTube, you can, you can see Captain Peter Kelleher um, of, of the Irish Army kind of uh, reenacting it. But his, that performance is totally different from what it was originally in the sense of like, instead of this crowd paying attention, silence, solemnity, the power of uh, his language, um, Pierce's reading out of it was, was, a, was a very different kind of event, but it was a, still an event that changed Irish history. And, and one other thing, I, we talked about this uh, just a couple of days ago at Newman College, the terrific conference that uh, Chile and others organised. What, what's, what's striking is that Pierce and his mates are part of the, you know, the knowledge society of Dublin at the time. You know, they're the literati, right? And I know they're rushing the document, but they forget one thing. They forget to record this for history. There's no photographer on the spot. There is no black and white snap of Pierce reading this document, which yeah. seems to me an exceptional miss. Yes, but on, on the other hand, perhaps that adds to the mystique of it, the fact that we don't have a visual record of it. And I think it, they were obviously under, under pressure and they didn't have like a crew of like media, like <laughs> minders, you know. But um, they had a great eye to history. <laughs> yes, yeah. But actually there is an image of uh, that very day, uh, you know, a, a man called McQueenie actually um, gets a, a, a priest called um, you know, uh, Father Kerwin to photograph him looking at the proclamation. Um, so there was, even within hours of it being kind of performed, there was a sense that this is, this is a really big thing. Yeah. 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 Fergal, did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, there is another dimension to this, which is the, the, the proclamation is the founding moment, really, of, of, of what becomes the Irish state. But at the time, its importance is, is really not, not realised by anyone probably apart from Pierce and Connolly. So the, the rising was planned in complete secrecy the, by a military council of seven people, four of which incidentally were involved in theatre, which I think is very revealing. But <laughs> they, um, they didn't tell the rebels what they were going to do. And the biggest rebel force was the Irish Volunteers. And th that wasn't a Republican force, they were just nationalists. So uh, two <coughs> things you notice in the Bureau of Military History witness statements, which give us hundreds of eyewitness accounts from, from inside the GPO. Um, you know, uh, one is that a lot of rebels didn't notice that the proclamation had taken place. It just was, they, they were putting sandbags in the windows or whatever. It, it wasn't this great moment in history, except afterwards. Um, and the second thing that comes across is, um, those rebels who did hear about the proclamation went, oh, a republic, why are we re proclaiming a republic? They weren't in on the, the general kind of PR concept. And some of them asked, for example, Tom Clark, why have we proclaimed a republic? And Tom Clark said, well, we must do something to seize the imagination of the world. And he was thinking of America in particular as a kind of model. And of course it worked because the, the um, Easter Rising was, re was reported front page news on the New York Times day after day for two weeks. So the leadership understood the propaganda dimension. For the volunteers, they were just going to fight. And a lot of them actually thought they had a chance of winning the fight. They didn't realize th the different strategy that was at work higher up. John, let me dr bring you in at, at this point. Uh, you've discovered this extraordinary mob of revolutionaries in your family. And they go way back to mm. Before 1803, let's talk about 1798 first. Yeah, what have you discovered in your family connections well, there? Well, can I point out first that my, three of my grandparents were born in Ulster. Um, the other grandparent, my mother's mother, was born in New Zealand. And when I was a kid, everybody I knew had been born in New Zealand. I didn't know anybody who hadn't been born in New Zealand. And the whole family came from New Zealand and I spoke to my grandmother about the fact that we quite clearly didn't come from New Zealand for various reasons. And she began to try and remember the provenance of all the stories that she'd heard. And on that basis, I began to do a sort of a family history starting when I was a kid. And I discovered, among other uh, things, that my great, 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 great four, I think, was um, involved in the 1798 uprising in Ireland, he was the, a general and he was in charge of the rebel troops in Tipperary and he was hanged by the high sheriff of Tipperary without a trial. His name was Thomas Judkin Fitzgerald and um, he, at the time he had three small children and um, his wife was left with them and I came to the State Library of Victoria 
and having discovered this, and because I, there's not a lot of not a lot of documentary stuff available about the 1798 rebellion. It's a long time ago. It was a pretty messy affair. I think a lot of stuff went into the shredder. And um, I presented myself at the inquiry's desk here and said, um, I've read in a book here that, that somebody that Thomas Judkin Fitzgerald ordered to be beaten and then he threw him into a cell and forgot him. And but he survived, and after the uprising, he brought a civil action for what we would call war crimes against Thomas Judkin Fitzgerald. And I'd like to see a copy of the transcription of that, if I possibly could, <laughs> because it might mention my guy. And where on the world would, be the, would, would you find a transcription of a trial in the Irish Assizes in 1799, and they said second floor? <laughs> Not even, thought, not even a blink. No, I thought, what a fantastic place this is. And certain, <laughs> there they were, Howells trials are all up there. My blokes mentioned. So I then get a bit fired up and I start investigating all sorts of other people. And he had various... Um, uh, his three children went on to have other children. And one of, whom, one, one of his grandchildren was Richard O'Gorman, who was an 1848 Young Ireland um, member. He escaped, he didn't get sent to Van Diemen's Land, he got to America where he became a judge. And um, his, his family was still in touch with this particular part of my family. And, and um, I then eventually encountered a, a woman called Kathleen Fox who was a painter and my mother, my mother who was, happened to be in Ireland at the time, went to the Dublin School of Art where Kathleen had learnt her art and, and I was just going to say, could we start the slide loop again? Thank you very much. And we'll see two um, uh, slides that John's going to talk about. This is the Kathleen Fox portrait. So, John, tell us the background on this. Well, let me just tell you that my mother... The reason that I know all this is that my mother went to the inquiry's desk at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, where Kathleen had been a student and then a teacher, and she said, hello, I'm from New Zealand. I wonder if anybody could tell me anything about an Irish painter called Kathleen Fox. And the woman said, yes, I can tell you all about her. She's my grandmother. <laughs> and it's from that connection that all of this good news arrived into my in-tray. And <laughs> Kathleen Fox was teaching at the art school in, in 1916. And she heard that there was a rising and she went down the street and she was walking down towards the Green and the College of Surgeons. And she saw a large, what she describes as a large sea of yellow. And she couldn't work out what it was. She thought, that's an interesting thing to paint. I don't know what it is. And then she saw a small streak of green uh, in the middle of it. And she said, oh, this is very, very interesting. And then she got a bit closer and realised that it was a huge ocean of people and that the yellow was actually khaki. They were British soldiers. And that the thin streak of green was the Irish citizen army being brought out of the college under arrest and then she got very close and she realised that standing in front of them was her friend, Constance Markovitz. Her husband, Casimir Markovitz, Constance's husband, was a painter and he worked at the art school. So she knew Constance and she knew quite a few of the other people. So she very quickly got out of her purse anything she could do a sketch on and she started sketching the shape of the buildings, the colours, the clouds, the, the composition. Because she thought, this is a fantastic... Whatever this is, it's a fantastic thing to paint. She hadn't worked out quite what it was at this stage because a lot of Dublin didn't know what was going on and she came from, as most of the people at the art school did and as Constance did and as Yates did, from a fairly middle-class, well-educated family. In her house, there would have been no knowledge of this, that this rebellion was going to happen at all. So... She took these drawings and did these notes and stuff, and then she couldn't do the port. She couldn't. She wanted to do this picture, but she couldn't do it at the art school because it was greatly frowned upon at the art school. She went to the art school after Easter, and people at the art school said, "Wasn't it awful what the Irish did in the weekend?" And Kathleen said, "I thought they were magnificent." And she said, "After that, there was a real atmosphere between me and some of my quite close friends." So this all surprised. So her John, is that all recorded in her diaries? No, she talks about yeah. this in an interview that was done right. in 1963. Mm 
where she, had, she was giving this painting, it was the last year of her life, and she was giving it to the Yates Museum because she was a great friend of Jack Yates. And this was the painting she did afterwards in privacy. She hired her own studio. She couldn't do it at home. They wouldn't approve. She couldn't do it at the art school. They wouldn't approve. So she hired a studio and she got models to come in and wear exactly the right uniforms. She knew about the uniforms. She had three brothers and they were all in the British Army. And the woman in the straw hat over there looking at you is Kathleen. She's put herself in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but everything else is... The documentary. And the Countess is in there somewhere, is that right? The Countess is, yes. The is Countess in is the, in next the pants. to the man with the rifle, yep. sloped rifle. Yep. yep. And she said one of the reasons this was such a striking scene is that the central figure in it was a woman. And in those days, she said, women didn't wear trousers. And here she was in a uniform. And she was a tall, very self possessed looking woman, Constance. And she said she was obviously the centre of what I was looking at. Um, and she did the painting and then the huge clampdown you mentioned afterwards had such an effect that she thought if anybody found, if the authorities found the painting, it would be confiscated. And a boy from the art school was going to America to try his luck in America and she said, would you mind taking it with me? And she, he took it to New York and it stayed in America for 30 years. And eventually came back and she kept it in her house until the last year of her life when she was giving it to the Yates Museum. Yeah, and that's where it is today. That's where it is, yeah, and yeah. it's quite a big painting. It's about um, uh, it's about half the size of one of those sort of bits between the buttresses. It's quite big, and it took a, she did various smaller versions of it, and then this version of it. And it's the the significance of it really is that it's the only painting done during the Rising that was done from sketches at the time. It's like it's I thought of it, when I was thinking about this. I thought it's the equivalent of having an iPhone at the Easter Rising because she did it on impulse at the time as a documentary record. And by all means, she's put it together later. And she knew, and the other irony is that two of her brothers had been killed earlier, one in Khartoum and one in some other... So region. they're fighting for king and country. Yeah, and, and one of them, the only surviving brother, her brother Charles, uh, he's an officer in the British Army. Her sister's married to a guy who won the Victoria Cross and her brother wins the DSO and is captured by the Germans and he's in a German prison camp and he escapes and is the first British officer to get back to England. So at the time that Kathleen is having inside herself the experience perfectly described by Yeats in the poem, the total shift of political outlook um, her brother is invited to Buckingham Palace because the king wants to meet him and give him his DSO personally. And um, is but that, I think is that the brother who then later is asked to lead the Black and Tans, yeah, and he and resigns, refuses? resigns from yeah. the British Army. Yeah. He's yeah. the brother in one of these pictures. If they roll through, there's a picture of a red-headed woman on the left and a man on the right. That's a self-portrait of Kathleen with yeah. her brother. Okay, can I, just, Fergal, can I just bring you in for a comment on that? What's John's described there, of course, again, this would have been, am I right, true all over Dublin. Families would have been arguing with deep divisions about where they sided. Yeah, I mean, the, the rebels would have been in a tiny minority and um, most people in Dublin were, were Catholics and they were nationalists, but they were supporters of John Redmond, which was the mainstream Irish Constitutional Nationalist Party. And of course, huge numbers of them were, were fighting on the Western Front. So part of the anger towards the rebels during Easter week is the fact that they're, you know, they're seen to sort of stab Britain at the, uh, in the back in this moment of crisis. And of course, a lot of these Irishmen, they go off in 1914, 1915, with huge crowds of Dubliners waving and cheering. And they're, they're seen as they're, they're fighting for Irish freedom because they're fighting for home rule, for self-government to come to Ireland, and that's been put on the statute book. And that's the future that everybody expects before 1916. And then some of these guys come back in 1918, 1919, and they're seen to be kind of traitors to have fought on the wrong side. So there's a kind of a suppression of the, of the, of the memory and the commemoration of all those people because they find themselves on the wrong side of history, even though, of course, they were very representative of, of mainstream opinion at the time. It's that shift between the executions and also actually, also an issue in Australia, the conscription crisis, the whole experience of, of, of uh, radicalization that, that creates a different Ireland within about two years from the Easter Rising. Let me, while, you, while you've touched on the, 
on that question. Let's, let's go back a bit. Um, the period before the war, of course, is this moment of high optimism. The Liberals are under Asquith in Westminster. Uh, Redmond, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, John Redmond's Irish Parliamentary Party has the balance of power after the 1910 elections. Is that right? Yep. And a deal is done, um, obviously, to deliver home rule. But what, what happens then? Because it's sort of, it's not delivered at the last minute, in spite of royal assent. Yeah, I mean, Just take I, us through that. Yeah, I mean, uh, ironically, it's the Irish Party's achievement of home rule that, that really begins the revolution, um, the revolutionary process, uh, and it's, uh, the, the, the key issue really, that the key issue that starts the revolutionary ball rolling, is the response in Ulster. So, home rule is overwhelmingly popular throughout most of Ireland, but there's a, there's a strong um, Protestant Unionist majority in Ulster, and they not only campaign against a prospect of home rule, but they, they arm themselves, they form a volunteer militia, the Ulster Volunteer Force, um, and they, they essentially go to the verge of uh, rebellion. They, 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 it's, it's the Unionists who are first to proclaim a provisional government in 1914. And of course, when the British fail to clamp down against the Ulster Unionists, it gives the, the, the radical Republicans the chance to do precisely the same thing. So they set up the Irish Volunteer Force, a mirror version, the Ulster Volunteers armed themselves, bringing in guns uh, to Larne. The Irish Volunteers bring in guns to Hoth. And suddenly, you know, by, by the, by the uh, eve of the First World War, it's looking like there, there may well be some kind of civil war in Ireland because of Ulster's ref refusal, I suppose, to accept the Home Rule legislation. And the most likely outcome is that there'll be some kind of partition. But the outbreak of the First World War sort of transforms the situation instantly and there's a kind of a, a truce really on both sides. The Ulster Unionists and the Irish Nationalists support the war effort and everything gets put on hold. Uh, but by the time you get to 1916, there's a sense of tension rising, there's a fear of conscription being imposed. And fundamentally, for Fenians, the outbreak of war means England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity and they feel almost compelled to have a rising, even though there's no, not much chance of military success or in fact of popular support. And one of the reasons the rising is kind of on a small scale is because quite a lot of Republicans within these movements, like the Irish Volunteers, feel it's kind of madness to have a rising without popular support that has no chance of military success. But given the, the resistance of the North, as you've described then, is there any question um, at any point of things that might have been different? Had a way been found to implement Home Rule, could 1916 have been avoided? Yeah, I mean, there were literally, in, in June, July 1914, they were in Buckingham Palace, poring over maps, trying to work out where the line goes through Tyrone and Fermanagh. They were really close to a partition settlement that would have been maybe temporary. Uh, if Home Rule had been brought in, which is what everyone expected, if it had been brought in before the war began, it's difficult to imagine a rising could have taken place in the same way that it did, because it would have been a rising against an Irish nationalist administration. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fascinating quad if of history. But if you look at the bigger picture, I mean, what happens throughout much of Europe um, in the aftermath of the First World War is that the, the power of empire collapses. New nation states emerge, nationalism becomes dominant. So, so it's quite possible that there would have been some other form of revolutionary conflict because home rule was, was, it was very little on offer. And one of the things that spurred the, uh, the rebels on was the belief that home rule would keep Ireland within the United Kingdom state, okay, to get, a, to get an assembly, but they would remain part of the UK, to re remain part of the British Empire, and they'd end up like the Scots and the Welsh that true nationality would die. So it, it's a tricky question, but I think it's quite likely there could have been some broader revolution as happened in 1919, perhaps if the British had tried to impose conscription as they did in 1918. So I think the, f the historical forces demanding not just self-government, but independence w were growing. And that was a kind of almost like a revolutionary shift. It, it was very much young people who were, who were rebelling, not just against Britain, but also against the conservatism of, of, of the previous generation. Gillian, where, how do you view the the reaction of of the British, um, the the almost immediate um, uh, executions, and as you pointed out this week as well, yeah. the um, the uh, suppression of the records of those military trials for a hundred years almost. Yes, um, the like the trials of of the rebels were conducted as part of like secret military courts martial. Um, it was unlike the Emmett trial of 1803. Uh, yeah, which is unlike the Emmett trial, which was actually a, a public trial with a jury. And so that meant that actually Emmett's trial received publicity. But in a sense, like no one knew like what the proceedings, and, and they were actually 
um, uh, legally unjustifiable um, that you know General Maxwell decided that uh, he he would prosecute the rebels in this way. So, and it's only really uh, in 2003 that um, those uh, trial records were uh, made public by the Public Record Office in the UK. So, um, like they had to be kept secret. Um, uh, which is, a, you know, a sign of like um, the enormity of, of the impact of of the rising on like the stability of the British Empire uh, and the threat it re represented to the British Empire at its heart, which is the Union, the whole idea of the Union, which had been set up in in 1801, the Union of Great Britain and Ireland. So this was like at a time of war to kind of dismantle or threaten that in any way was profoundly threatening to um, the, to Great Britain as, as a whole, yeah. And I suppose like one of the, um, what, what, what happens um, afterwards is like, uh, as Fergal said, the, you know, the executions change public opinion. Um, and yeah, the, uh, basically the Irish Parliamentary Party loses authority again because of the, the like home rule being suspended. There's, uh, the, I think that the first, the impact of the First World War occurring when it did can't be overestimated on, on this whole situation. But given that, I mean, just again, just to talk about, as I said, the, the executions of the mm -hmm. rebels are seen as the turning point in terms yep. of sentiment. No, no, everyone agrees on that. Did the, given the fact that this is the height of the war, did the British have any choice? This is an insurrection. The empire's at war. Mm. Yeah, would, and the, would they have dealt with rebels in any other part of the the realm any differently? Uh, quite, quite likely. Fargo, do you want to comment? I mean, on that? The, the, yeah. during during this period, they were shooting young men on the Western Front for yeah. for cowardice, for not fighting. I think any other imperial power would have probably reacted more harshly. The number of people, as I said before, they executed was was actually kind of. You know, it wasn't large. When General Maxwell comes over to Ireland, he begins shooting rebels, and almost immediately letters start coming from Downing Street saying, what are you doing? How, how many are you going to shoot? You're going to stop soon, aren't you? So, so, and one of the problems is that, that the, the Dublin Castle political administration is suspended, and you basically have military rule, the first time since the 17th century. And the military logic um, steps in, and the, 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 the politics of the question don't matter. It's about what do you do to win the war? So you have to suppress the rebellion as quickly as possible. You have to send out a clear message, um, and you have to have a harsh, draconian um, response. But, but within that, I think it's kind of measured. But they, they, they shoot enough to, to, to completely uh, transform things. But I think in terms of British public opinion, they had to shoot the leaders. It's, it's inconceivable that they could have responded more leniently, I think. John, can I bring you back in at this point? Because clearly Kathleen uh, Fox is, is reacting to these extraordinary uh, events. Mm. Um, but she goes on and, and has a connection with the famous Daniel Mannix a few years later. Yeah. So tell us about that. Now, we finally, we've seen this a couple of times. Yes. This is, we've got the portrait up here, John, of yeah, that's the Kathleen. gorgeous Kathleen. That's and, Kathleen on and the this left. this is her brother. That's Charles Vincent Fox, DSO, winner of the Henley Single Skulls. <laughs> Um, well, that's important. He's an officer in the most, what she describes as the most conservative unit in the British Army, the Royal <laughs> Scots Guards, in which unit he was known as Major Sinn Féin. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> um, well, the other interesting thing, that, just to pick up before we go there, sure. that, 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 uh, that, 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 that there's a generational thing which interests me a good deal, and the point has been made about the fact that some of these people were actors. One of the things Kathleen says in this interview, fabulous interview done in 1963, is that she knew Constance Markovitz because her husband, Casimir, was at the art school. She knew Willie Pierce. He was a sculptor. She knew his brother. He was Patrick a poet. Patrick Pierce's brother. Yeah, mm. she knew, yeah, she knew Patrick because he was often at the art school. And he was executed as well, wasn't he? Yes. Willie Pierce? Yeah, yeah they were both executed. She knew Joseph Plunkett because her great friend from childhood, Grace Gifford, who lived just down the road from where she was living in, still in 1963 in Milltown, her great friend Grace Gifford, who was her model and was also at the art school with her, was Joseph Plunkett's girlfriend and she talked her way into Kilmainham Jail the night before he was executed and took a priest in a ring and got married. Mm. 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 Um, 
a 10 minute ceremony apparently. But the, but the way she tells it, it's almost the art school rebellion. <laughs> so, and it's definitely generational. She couldn't, and, and all of the parents, I mean, her, Grace Gifford's mother threw her out of the house because of her relationship with Joseph. Um, in the Gifford family, there were three daughters and three sons, and the deal between the Catholic parents and the Catholic parent and the Protestant parent is that the girls were brought up Protestant and the boys were brought up Catholic. So when she got off with Joseph, her mother wouldn't have anything to do with her. Yeah, I recognise this. I was around in the 60s. <laughs> this is, you know, there's, a, I, there's a, something... I want you to tell us a story yeah. of Kathleen and Daniel Mannix. Yes, yes, well, Kathleen was a very good painter and she became quite a well-known painter. And in 1920, she had a studio in Paris and a studio in London. And Daniel Mannix went from Australia to Ireland. I think he might have been going to see his mother. Um, after the First World War when shipping became more readily available. And the British didn't like Daniel. So Daniel was on a commercial vessel, but they nevertheless sent two destroyers out and they stopped the vessel in the middle of the ocean and they took Daniel off it and they put him on a destroyer and said, you're not going to Ireland, pal. You're coming to London. So they prevented him from going to Ireland and they let him stay in London. And the word quickly went round in London, who knows, a first-class painter with the right political credentials as well, who can come to Nazareth House in Hammersmith where, where Mannix was staying and do a portrait because we want this moment to be recorded. We want everybody to know he was here, this happened. And Kathleen said she thought it was a wonderful thing to be offered but she felt a bit selfish doing it on her own so she sent a telegram to a mate of hers who was a sculptor in Dublin saying get on the boat and get on the train and be here by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. There's work for both of us. There's work, <laughs> yes, and while I'm doing the portrait you can do a, a bust. So Albert Power uh, turned up in the morning uh, as instructed and, but he had no gear, he had no clay, he had no stand, he had no kit, he had nothing. And so she tells an interesting story about getting hold of some stuff but they then present themselves at Nazareth House and she does a portrait and in her portrait Mannix is in his full regalia every, you know, all the sort of the hat and the gowns and everything and in Albert Power's head he isn't he's got no hat on and he looks a bit like Elvis <laughs> he's got very good hair and, and, there's, and there's plenty of it. That was before he had a weight problem. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And so she said, she said uh, that, um, she said that um, he did this in clay and he then took it back to Dublin and uh, she said that he, he, on the train he couldn't fit it where he was so he put it in the aisle and the train was full of British soldiers and they, she said she thought Mannix was going to get skittled or sat on or something but he got him there and she said he made from this clay model, a beautiful white marble head which was bought by Melbourne for 500 pounds. And so I rang the archdiocese and said, does anybody know anything about this? And they said, no, how very intriguing. Can we hear the interview? So I went over there and played the interview and they said, oh, that's fantastic. So they went away and had a look and they, uh, Rachel Norton, the excellent archivist over there, rang me excitedly a few days later saying, we have got it. It's brilliant. It's the basis of all of the images of Mannix that have been done since. And the statues. And, mm, and, mm. and she said, I've, we, what we did today is that we lifted, I pushed it off its little base and on the bottom of it, it says the name of the sculptor and the date. And we've looked up that sculptor a number of times and found nothing else about him. But we got an Irish speaker in today and he said, that's Albert Power in English. <laughs> He's written his name in Irish. I'm, I'm, amazed they, I'm amazed they hadn't checked that. No. The, the Gaelic club was down the road. Yeah, know? so I'm all right for drinks up at the Archdiocese <laughs> at the moment. I think, Kevin, I just want to bring you back in. I'm coming out to our audience soon. I'm sure there are some, some questions uh, from our audience. But, Kevin, the I, I think... Um, I'm right in saying Mannix was on his way to Ireland, never gets to Ireland because the British do not let him in, which brings us to the point can I, that... Can I just add yep. that when that Brendan Isle says that when he came back, having not got to Ireland, he got off the boat on Christmas Island and had his photo taken because he thought Billy Hughes wouldn't let him back into Australia. <laughs> well, plus ça change, one could only say, yes. Um, uh, Kevin, the, the point is, and again, as we heard um, 
in accounts at Newman College during the week. Uh, Post-1916 in Australia is, is an interesting and a tricky place for Irish-Australian declared Republicans, is it not? It is. I mean, Australia had always had a, a very strong Redmanite tradition, and uh, when the Redmans arrived in Australia in 1883 uh, to establish support for the parliamentary system, um, that had proved very successful. And, um, you know, a great deal of money had, had been transferred back to Ireland, and, and you know, we've still got records of that um, in the, the Joseph Winter collection. The, the, the executions um, certainly acted as a direct challenge to uh, the support for Redmond, and lots of, of Irish Catholics had joined up at the beginning of the First World War um, and had willingly fought, um, and a lot of them knew that uh, home rule was promised. The executions seemed to to make uh, a great shift in, in public opinion, and um, and that happened rather dramatically. And um, support for Sinn Féin grew. Uh, the, the Redmanite rump uh, that was left certainly in Victoria diminished, um, and the party was finally wound up in, in the 1920s. Um, the fact that Mannix had thrown his support behind Sinn Féin, and I think Mannix had personal connections with, um, with a lot of the, the, the people in Sinn Féin in Dublin. Um, that, I think, swayed public opinion um, immensely. Um, you know, Mannix was, was somebody people looked to for, for direction, as well as you know, him reflecting what, the, you know, what his, his flock wanted. Um, and um, so you do, you do get the split. You, you do get the sudden change. Um, so that by by 1920, um, yes, support for what is happening in Ireland, support for the Sinn Féin agenda, um, is extremely strong. Yeah, okay. uh, Fergal, just before I come out to the audience, just, just this question of Sinn Féin, because as, if you, if you, as you've said, Sinn Féin don't organise um, 1916. But they they cop they, they cop they're tagged with it, aren't they? Afterwards, yes. immediately. So Sinn Fein is Arthur Griffith's party, and mm. it's uh, it's got a complicated politics, a dual monarchy. It wants it accepts some kind of link with Britain, but it's nonviolent and it's not republican. But the term Sinn Feiner is widely used in this period to mean just a radical nationalist. Right. Um, the I IRB, IRB Fenians, for example, would have would have been part of the Sinn Fein very broad movement. So as soon as the rising begins, you get these headlines saying Sinn Feiner revolt. Uh, and of course it's not, I mean Sinn Féin aren't, uh, haven't planned it, but what does happen in, in, really in, the, in, the, in the months after the rising is that doesn't, the rising hasn't been brought about by any political party, so they need a political party, and the Republicans sort of pile into Sinn Féin and effectively take it over. And Arthur Griffith, who set up the party 15 years before, is pushed aside, and Eamon de Valera, mm. who, who really just stands for the 1916 tradition, becomes mm. the president of Sinn Féin, mm. so it effectively becomes a Republican party. Um, and also a party that supports the use of violence to achieve independence, so it transforms itself. Speaking of de Valera, he escapes, you know, the firing squad. Is that a bit sus? Well, so, some people attribute it to the fact that he was born in America and there was some kind of jiggery-pokery American passports, American involvement, but the evidence for that is quite thin, actually, and I, I think he's probably, he shouldn't have escaped because he was a commandant of a garrison and all the other commandants were executed, so he was very lucky, but I think it was probably the timing, but two weeks into the executions, there was enormous pressure from Downing Street to, to stop the, the killings, and some of the decisions were quite arbitrary, like Willie Pierce, for example, wasn't a significant leader, but he gets killed. So I think he was just, you know, in the, in the, in the chaos of the time, he was, he was fortunate to survive. But some people would say, slightly controversial point back in Ireland, but de Valera was probably the most conservative of the leaders, but because he's the last um, surviving leader, he becomes really the figurehead of the new Irish Republican movement, and he goes on to play a role in creating what is a very conservative Catholic nationalist state, which in many ways doesn't reflect the radicalism of the proclamation, which, which with people like James Connolly and with gender equality and so on. So de Valera remains quite a contentious figure because of his influence and uh, uh, over the next half century. Mm -hmm. okay. well, look, I want to thank you for those uh, reflections. Could you please show your appreciation for our audience?